Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to chapel. We're so glad that you're with us. Today is a special day. In a moment, we're going to get a chance to hear a message uh, uh, related to Kaleo Chapel. But before we do that, wanted to recognize that today is Veterans Day. And uh, and we wanted to recognize all those who are part of the APU community who are military connected. We know we have a number of students who are veterans themselves. We know that we have students whose parents have served uh, or grandparents, and so we're so thankful uh, for those who have uh, served our country. And so we'd like to start uh, by welcoming you to chapel and also by opening in a word of prayer, particularly keeping in mind uh, those who are military connected. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to be together in worship and to worship together in this way. And today, especially, we want to recognize uh, those who are military connected in our community at APU. Uh, we thank you for the sacrifices involved. We thank you for those who have given of their lives even and for those who have given portions of their lives to serve our country um, for our freedoms that uh, we are blessed to have. And so, Lord, we recognize those um, who have uh, gone before us, for those who have served, for those in our community who have served in various ways. We ask your blessing and protection on those in active service, and we thank you, Lord, uh, just for allowing us to have this, uh, this opportunity to worship together in this way, which is a reminder of the freedoms that uh, we've been given as, as this country. So, Lord, we thank you. Uh, we ask your blessing on uh, all of our community today. In Christ's name, amen. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to Wednesday Chapel. It's nearing the end of the semester, and I don't know about you guys, but I am so tired. I am not ready to take on these next couple weeks. And I've heard from a lot of people that chapel's starting to become a little bit commonplace, a little bit normal, a little bit, dare I say, boring. You press play, turn volume down, and go down to your next tab and finish your tasks. But I wanted to encourage us and remind us that this is such a blessing that we're able to worship together in this time. We should not be able to worship in a pandemic. That is not something that is possible, really. Like the early Christians were scattered across the world while they were being persecuted. We're also scattered across the world right now in different places at different times of day, and yet we're still able to worship God what a blessing, what a privilege. Let us not take that for granted, that we are all singing to the same God. We are all serving the same God in different countries, in different states, as different people. What a blessing to worship together. God is so good in giving us this opportunity. So we're going to sing about how good he is. Amen. Can you like clap your hands even in front of your computer? Clap your hands this morning or whatever time it is. Give them the worship you learned.
good. Lord, you are so good and you are worthy of our praises, Lord. Wherever we're at right now, Jesus, we want to give you the honor and glory for the things that you have done, the things that you are doing, the things that you will do in our lives. You are a powerful, moving, present Father, and we acknowledge that right now. We thank you for that reminder. We thank you for the times that we can clap our hands with joy because you are so good to us. We love you, Jesus, in your heavenly name. Amen.
from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint by his blood Goodbye. 
Love you so much and we thank you that you loved us first and you love us always God your grace and your mercy nothing can match them ever nothing ever will God so we take this moment in prayer to offer ourselves to you yet again if we've lost our way we find our way back to you right now God would you help us along the way? Would you meet us where we are at in this very second? Because God, we will never stop needing you and we will never stop wanting more of you. So may our praise this morning or this afternoon, this evening be glorifying to you because you know our hearts and you know when we are worshiping in spirit and in truth, God. I pray that you would seek that from us and that you would teach us to seek that more as we live every day in your light and share it with the world, God. We love you and we praise you, Jesus. Thank you for all you have done and all you have given. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hello, APU students, and welcome to our last Kaleo Chapel of the semester. I know that time has gone by in a weird kind of way and fast, but at the same time, not nonchalantly just passing by. But we are grateful that you guys have been tuning in uh, wherever you guys are at. And hopefully this has been an unexpected blessing for you all, uh, wherever you are at and wherever you have been. And so in this week's Kaleo Chapel, we will be missing Pastor, Pastor Tatiana as she is on maternity leave and so we are excited for her but at the same time we miss her and we are praying for her and her family about what's about to take place and so before we dive into the main bulk of our message today in which our grad intern Lauren Dawson will be bringing to us I want to just recap this semester's Kaleo chapels for us and then read the passage of scripture that we will be diving into today and then give a little context of it and so in our first Kaleo chapel we talked about the salt and light of the earth and we were reminded that in the book of Matthew uh, of Jesus being the promised Messiah and how this promised Messiah calls us to be the salt and light of the earth. And that we are essentially called to be the flavor of Christ and the light of Christ in a world that so desperately needs it. 
And then in our next Kaleo Chapel, we talked about the Beatitudes as they are the kingdom realities that we could tap into. And that as we read the Beatitudes, we find ourselves in different places within the Beatitudes. But much more, we find ourselves in a place of deep need. And that it's okay for us to be in a deep place of deep need because that's where Christ meets us. And then in our third Kaleo Chapel, we talked about the call of Matthew. In which we had our pastor, Wesley Parker Reed, walk us through what a modern day Matthew looks like. And how there are no throwaway people in the kingdom of heaven. And that Jesus calls us to be in proximity to Jesus. Because proximity to Jesus changes things in us, through us, and around us. Which leads us to our last Kaleo Chapel in which we talked about the yoke of Christ. And we became aware in this chapel of different yokes that we are carrying that are not kingdom-like. Different yokes that we have been carrying that have been burdening us that we can release so that we can take upon the yoke of Jesus that brings us rest. Which leads us to this Kaleo Chapel in which we will be diving into the Great Commission. And before Lauren comes up and breaks down what that passage means for us today, I want to just read this passage for us and give a little context. And so would you hear the reading, this reading from the Gospel of Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they had saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord, all thanks be to God. And when we hear this passage, there are a lot of echoes within our own church traditions of this being a key passage to our evangelic endeavors of going out into the world and making disciples of all nations. Or for many of our church traditions, it's making Christians of all nations, right? And one of the reasons why I believe that this has been a key passage for us is because these were essentially, in the book of Matthew, the last words of Jesus to his disciples, and in these last words that of Jesus to his disciples, there were imperatives and commands in which Lauren will be diving into of this going and this making of disciples of all nations. But for me, I want us to kind of dig into the cultural background, background of what a disciple me, meant in Jesus' day to help us better understand what a Jesus disciple was so that we can better understand what it means for us to be a Jesus disciple today. And so in Jesus' day, right, uh, there, Jesus grew up in a first century Jewish culture. And in the first century Jewish culture, there was a rabbinic tradition that took place. And this rabbinic tradition that took place would be of your rabbis of the day. And the rabbis of the day were essentially your teachers of the day who were interpret the Torah, which for us is the first five books of the Bible. But those were the scriptures that they had. And so the rabbis would interpret the Torah and would devote their lives in, in living out their interpretations of the Torah in devotion to God. And so what rabbis would do in Jewish society is they would pick people around Jewish society to follow them. And these people that would follow them would be their disciples. And so the disciples in definition of that culture would be one that took upon the yoke of their rabbi's teachings, right? And so if your rabbi were to choose you, then you would become his disciple and you would devote your whole life to following your rabbi in order to live with your rabbi and be with your rabbi in order to do what your rabbi does, right? And so what your rabbi would do in Jewish society is he would be petite about who he chose because he was really respected. Rabbis were really respected, honored, and revered in Jewish society. And so they didn't just pick anybody random, right? And so if this rabbi wasn't convinced that you had what it takes to do what they do, he wouldn't pick you, right? And so a rabbi would end up choosing the top of the top cats in Jewish society or the top of the top people in Jewish society, which is so contrary to Jesus, right? And so this is where Jesus' rabbinic tradition enters because Jesus didn't pick the top of the top people in Jewish society. Matter of fact, he chose very ordinary people like Martha, Mary, Simon Peter, Andrew, Matthew to follow him, right? And the reason why he chose ordinary people is because he believed that ordinary people can do as he does and take upon the yoke of his teachings, right? And so a Jesus disciple was one who took upon the yoke of Jesus' teachings, and devoted their lives to a posture of learning about Jesus from being with Jesus in order to emulate Jesus and in order to do what Jesus does. And so a disciple often took upon the posture of humility and of learning. And so what does that mean for us today as we listen to what a Jesus disciple was as disciples of today, right? I would like for us to reframe that question and ask uh, instead, what is the yoke 
that Jesus is teaching you in this season? What is the yoke that Jesus has for you uh, to teach you in this season? And maybe take some of these suggestions in as uh, I read these suggestions. And hopefully this is an invitation for you to formulate your own or take these as yours. And so maybe ask God, Lord, what is the yoke that you are asking of me as a disciple in regards to your commands, in regards to your word, in regards to your spirit? Is it a yoke of learning what it means to apply the mind of Christ to today's issues by learning from a diversity of perspectives to a diversity of experiences? Is it a yoke of learning from my neighbors what racial reconciliation looks like? Is it a yoke for me to spend time renewing my mind about certain people in my life, about certain situations, and about certain things? Is it a renewing of my heart to receive the making of me from people who are around me that aren't like me? Is it a yoke of learning how to stand in solidarity with my other brothers and sisters around the globe who are suffering and are hurting? Regardless of what this yoke is, I hope that it invites you into a posture of learning into a posture of humility because that's a posture a disciple often takes. And so as Lauren comes up and gives to us uh, the message in the Great Commission of what it means to go and to make, I want for us to continue to keep this in mind that we are still uh, being discipled as well as called to be disciple makers. And so would you welcome with me Lauren Dawson. Thank you, band, for leading us, and thank you, Mason, for opening us today. If we have yet to meet, hi, my name is Lauren. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to um, share what the Great Commission means, and even just as I found out that I was going to be talking about the Great Commission, I reflected on what that meant for me, what discipleship meant for me to not only be a disciple, but those that have discipled me for a very long time. Um, and just thinking about where we are right now in week 11, um, I don't know how each of you are feeling, but for me, the process of going through Kaleo this semester to be in different parts of Matthew has been so life-giving um, as just each part that we've gone through has been something that spoke to me, and I hope that today speaks to you wherever you may be. Because as I reflected on the topics that we've discussed leading up to today and viewing Matthew as a whole, I couldn't help but feel like it serves as a manual for what discipleship is. Because we both look at the life of Jesus, but also those that followed him. And in a sense, those that followed him closely, which would be the crowds, but also the disciples who were right alongside him. Um, and we as a reader are invited to see what discipleship truly looked like, what it means for us to be disciples, and how to invite others into discipleship. Before jumping into the passage of Matthew 28, I actually wanna go backwards to Matthew 4, when Jesus first calls disciples. In verse 18 through 19, it says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the seas, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. When Jesus calls the first disciples, he provides a command and a promise, which is exactly what we see when we go to the end at the Great Commission. And as I studied and read through the Great Commission, I couldn't help but think about my own parents. Um, wherever they would drop me off or leave home, the last words they gave me were words of instruction. It was the things that I needed to remember in their absence to do um, until they returned. And in the Great Commission, it encompasses the last words of Jesus, the last instruction that he gives to the disciples that they are to remember, that we as disciples are to remember until the day that he returns. As it says, he was with the 11 disciples on the mountain in Galilee. And when the disciples saw him, they both worshiped him, but some disciples doubted. And I can't blame them. He has just been resurrected. He's in the, they're in the presence of Jesus again, which we can't think that they might have known that that was going to happen like they did. But imagine the awe and wonder, the thoughts and feelings of the disciples to be in the presence of Jesus again as he's giving this commission. The response to both worship him and for some who doubted, seems like the most reasonable response to be in a moment that feels so surreal. I can think of moments during COVID when I finally saw friends again that felt surreal. And one of the first things that Jesus says to the disciples 
is a statement of assurance. He tells them that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The literal definition of authority can refer to the right to do something or to act in a particular manner, like giving an order, enforcing obedience, or influencing one another. It is at the end of Matthew, after the crucifixion, that Jesus declares all authority has been given to him. This moment is a culmination of Matthew within the narrative, displaying Jesus as the true soul and legitimate figure of authority in the universe because of his relationship to the Father and his role in the kingdom of God. I point this statement out as a statement of assurance because this, the attention then goes to the disciples with the command. Jesus instructs the disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. I read this verse over and over again um, because I couldn't help but get past the words go and make in a time that we're in COVID, let's be honest. The idea of go doesn't feel like it applies right now. It feels like, you know, we're physically distant and apart from one another. And I also just felt like, how am I supposed to walk alongside others when it feels like there's few around me? But then I thought about, what if that's the point? What if that's the point to think about not just going, but as we are going? Because for me, it was focusing on the go can feel like there's somewhere or someone that I have to get to, causing me to leave the setting I'm in to go to a place I wouldn't have thought of before. And I say this because when I used to hear this passage growing up, it was always the day that we talked about missionary work. And it's not to say that going to the far off places isn't important. It absolutely is. But I thought about Again, this concept of as we are going, to think about making disciples in the context that you find yourselves to be in. I remember in one of my classes, we talked about the importance of followers of Christ being involved in various types of organizations, businesses, fields. If every follower of Christ were solely in the field of ministry, I think we would miss a handful of people. There would be no way to reach everyone, especially if only someone experiences the truth and life of Christ on a Sunday morning or Wednesday evening. But because each of you have unique callings to go into various fields of work, you have friends and family to walk alongside, you have the opportunity to do good work of discipleship, which is to make the daily decision to follow Christ be committed to the process of growth and transformation and inviting others to join you. My understanding and passion for discipleship started before coming to APU, but I think I really got it when I came to APU and I joined a D group. Being a part of campus ministry, all four years taught me to truly value community here. There's something beautiful about the growth when you choose to step into a life of being a disciple while also being discipled. There's so much to learn from others who are both in the same stage of life as you and sometimes they're older, sometimes they're younger. But I would argue our differences are what allow us to learn and broaden our understanding of the world in which we live in, but also the uniqueness of God. Something I learned during training last year as an undergrad intern was the concept of apprenticeship to Jesus. There are three, tape, three steps that we can take um, when partaking in apprenticeship to Jesus. And the first one is allowing, sorry, owing the journey, owning my part of the journey. And then allowing the journey to change me. And then welcoming others to join me on this journey. Discipleship is learning transforming, multiplying, fostering growth, partnership, fellowship, servanthood, community, and so much more. And you get to live this life if you choose to. 
Making disciples means that there's an invitation to live life as a disciple and being committed to the process of growth in discipleship. Baptizing and teaching describe the activities through which a person grows in discipleship. And thinking about this, I also thought about something my dad would say to me and still says to me. He would tell me, Lauren, love God in front of people and love people in front of God. This saying reminds me of the two greatest commandments that we've been given, to love God and to love our neighbor. So I think about this all as how we are to make disciples. And this brings me to the last part that there is the command, but there's also the promise. The promise is Jesus tells the disciples, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. To know that Jesus will be with us is a comforting truth. It's a comforting truth that we can hold on to that we're not doing this life of discipleship by ourselves. For me, it makes the mission to carry it out not as lonely. So during the week of Kaleo, the second week of Kaleo that we did, Mason and I took time to describe and explain the mural that's behind me. Um, we talked about the ideas and themes that brought to the final picture, and it touched on the symbolism of feeling surrounded by chaos. I know we just had election season, we're still gonna be in it for a while. I know that we're in week 11 of the semester, and some of us are flooded with schoolwork and anything and everything else that's on your plate right now. If I'm being honest, the last few months have been difficult in more ways than one, so I can only imagine where all of you are too. I realize that relying upon Jesus has felt like the only thing I can do some days, and yet somehow I still forget that I can do that. But then I'm thankful for those that choose to walk alongside me. The friends and family who check in for those who ask how I'm doing, not just to ask, but truly and patiently listen to how I'm doing. And I'm thankful that I get to walk this life with one hand holding on to Jesus and the other to my community. So I want us to look at the mural again today. I want us to specifically look at the hands in the middle that we talked about. Just as we're ending the end of the semester and getting ready for the holidays, I would like to ask you, whose hand are you holding in this upcoming season? For some of you, it will be holding tight to Jesus' hand to understand who you are as a disciple, his disciple. And for others of you, it will look like holding the hand of Jesus in one hand, but then also asking the Holy Spirit, who else's hand are you holding? Whose hands in community are you holding this next season? Wherever you may find yourself, I would ask that you join me in prayer. <sighs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you sent your son to show us what life with you can look like. That you gave him a mission that he then gave to us. Father, I ask that we would learn how to be committed to the greatest commandments and the greatest commission so that our brothers and sisters can know who you are can follow after you, to model their lives after you. And that's gonna look different for every person. May we learn to build relationships with others that are different than us, with our neighbor, both near and far. We have such a unique opportunity to be in discipleship, to follow you together. We thank you and we praise you for who you are and all that you do and that you are always with us. And it is in your name I pray, amen.